my great privilege and honor to invite Venerable Matthew Raycard on stage. I will not waste much time in introducing him. I would rather you find out for yourself. He is, he is a PhD in molecular genetics under a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He has become a monk. He is, he is a part of the Sechen Monastery in Kathmandu and associated with all their work, projects and works. He is an author, a best-selling author, on books like Happiness, Art of Meditation, Search of Wisdom, Altruism, innumerable books, and translations from Buddhist texts to French and English. I will, it is my deep, with deep gratitude and honor that I would invite on stage Mr. Matthew Raikard. Thank you, I'm very happy to join you and thank you, Professor, for this very insightful uh, presentation. So I'm going to try to you know, present a big, big perspective. And of course, you are major actors in not only social responsibility, but environmental responsibility, which are intimately linked in our time. And uh, I would argue that uh, one of the major challenges of the 21st century is to reunite three time scale. There's the short term. You, know, you need to balance your balance sheet at the end of the month and the year. That's, that's a need for you to survive. But there's also the mother in West Nepal, in Bihar, in India, in Darjeeling, somewhere in Africa, who need to feed their kids the next week. And so that's the immediate concern. Then there's the midterm. No, we all need to flourish in life, to have a decent life in democratic system, in, in peace and so forth. And we know how challenging that can be, you know, a lifetime. And you know, Winston Churchill said, a statement thinks of future generation, a politician about next election. So it's very difficult to, you know, take in consideration the aspiration for people to flourish in life. And then there's a new challenge. 10,000 years ago, there was only about 5 million human beings on Earth. No big deal. The impact was very small. Today is 8 billion. So in the 1950s, we entered the Anthropocene, the age where the human population is the major force to shape the fate of future generations. And the way we do it now, they will say, you knew and you did nothing. So we are today responsible for billions and billions and billions of people who are coming in the future. That's something new. We didn't expect that. We didn't plan that. So now, if we want to bring around a round table, social workers, people like you in enterprise and working in the active world, economists, investors, politicians, scientists, who will tell us about the environment, will tell us about social justice, with the idea that we will want to work together to a better world, except a few nutcases, we all wish a better world. So what concept? You know, it's like a schizophrenic dialogue because they're not speaking the same language. One is short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So selfishness will not do the job. You know, my favorite Marxist is Groucho Marx. Maybe you know about the Marx brother. He said, why should I care for future generation? What did they do for me? So well, that's what many people do today. No, they don't care what's going to happen in 100 years. So selfishness will not do the job. So what can do the common ID, pra pragmatic ID, is having more consideration for others. If we do have more consideration for others, we'll take care of the mother who need to feed their kids. We'll make sure that there is decent condition of life in all the countries and areas where you are also intervening and building things and welcoming people, and you have a power to do, make, make a difference. And then if we do have consideration for future generation, we will care for the fate of future generation and also for the biodiversity, those eight million other species which are co-citizens in this world. So that is the, briefly what I want to show. So it has to start by ourselves. You know, the society is made of individuals. So if we need to go from personal change to, okay, what happens? It's going wrong. To societal change. You know, we cannot have any more poverty in the midst of plenty as it happens in many countries. 
And we need to become more aware of our common humanity in times of uncertainty. And more than ever now, people are worrying because they are worrying about the future. You know, in many countries, young people don't want to have kids because they say, How, what will be their fate in 20, 30 years with the environment? There's this kind of anxiety. So we need this concept. What is altruism? What is basically benevolence? Having you know, consideration for others, basically, is to want to bring happiness to others. And we can do what we can with our own capacity and resources and time. Now, of course, when this altruism and benevolence meet with suffering, so altruism is the wish may people find happiness and the cause of happiness. Now, when it meets with suffering, and there's plenty of suffering in this world, it becomes compassion. The wish may the suffering and the cause of suffering be dispelled. So then also we need some wisdom. If we don't know what to do, it can be stupid compassion and stupid altruism. So we need to have discernment. We need to act in a wise way. There's also empathy. A lot of people speak of empathy. Empathy is the faculty to resonate with people. If I see you with a big smile, I start smiling. If you suffer, neuroscience have shown that you really suffer because of the suffering of others. So social worker, caregiver, nurse, doctors, they often uh, suffer from burnout because they ex constantly resonate with the suffering of others and becomes like unbearable sort of emotional burden. So we found in doing neuroscience research to which I participated that in fact, compassion and loving kindness is an antidote to empathic distress and burnout. And it can be used in many sectors of society. It's a different areas in the brain. So altruism and compassion is a win-win situation. You make others happy, and also that's the best way yourself to flourish in life. While selfishness is a lose-lose situation. If you think me, me, me all day long, first your life will be miserable, and you will make life miserable to everyone around you. So we need to also understand this sense of common humanity, interdependence. We are not isolated entities like snooker balls that sometimes eat each other and separate. We are intimately connected. So that is the base to realize that if I, deep within myself, I don't want to suffer, I want to be happy. So all of you, even we're confused on how to achieve happiness, but nevertheless that aspiration is there. So once we recognize that, then it's more easy to be concerned by others. So altruism and benevolence, caring for others, is a very pragmatic answer because, as I mentioned, selfishness will not do the job. So in the short term, we'll have a caring economics. You know, the homo economicus is supposed to maximize personal preferences. That goes nowhere. So we need an economy that is not only based on the voice of reason, but on the voice of care. That's the only way to address common goods, you know, the climate, quality of the air, of the ocean, environment, also poverty in the midst of plenty. In the midterm, we need more social justice. Inequalities have been growing widely over the last 20 years in the richest country. We know that 10, 15 people today own as much as the 25% poorest in the world. This, the system is something wrong. And so in the long term, we need to care for future generations. So poverty in the midst of plenty is a big problem. It's not only poor countries. Even in rich countries, there is a lot of, of misery. And this is not addressed properly. We're also abusing other species. You know, they are sentient beings. And they are not here just for us to use as instrument. And nevertheless, we are everything and they are nothing. We use them as we please. And that has taken gigantic industrial proportions, and the suffering is immense, but we care very little. And also, we're exhausting our planet as if it was under limited resources. The way we go now, we would need three planets in 30 years to continue to consume the way we do. A friend of mine called Joan Rockstrom has defined what we call planetary boundaries, this number of factors here that defined the stability of the climate. So in 1900, you know, we were well within the limits. In 1950s, it started to grow, and now, boom, we have gone vastly over the limit. It's no more sustainable. 
that since the climate crisis, has, the climate has been changing more than in a few hundred thousand years. So we need more cooperation. We have that in ourselves. We are social animals. We know and we love cooperation. Cooperation is much more rewarding than competition. And that's not only us, you know, this is part of every life. And we love to work together, to cooperate. Again, we are not the only one. And so, of course, there's a struggle for life. There are winners and losers. In that case, it's not the human being. But, you know, also we can have heroic acts. And also others can do it. You know, we're not the monopole of, of kindness. So, again, it starts with us. And we know people can be depressed. Mental sicknesses are one of the major causes in the world for not being able to function in life. So our mind can be our best friend, like my teacher, Ken Serenboshi. And also our mind can be our worst enemy. You know, so much increase of depression, of suicide in rich countries. So can we change that? So about uh, 25 years ago, we started a program of collaborating with top scientists to see if training the mind, what we call meditation sometimes, is just a way you know, to feel good and put two incense sticks in below a mango tree and relax and think of nothing, or does it bring a real change when you train your mind in attention, in compassion, in altruism? So, a few of us, like Migu Jamboshe here, who lives in Nepal, we collaborated with that. I just came out of three hours in fMRI. I think altogether I must have spent 120 hours in fMRI machines. So this is in Wisconsin, Madison, with Richard Davidson. And what was found is that long-term practitioners, meditators, they can have a huge increase in their brain activity when they focus on compassion, for instance. And you see the graph below. Those are untrained people. We taught them for one week. They came to the lab. Nothing happens. That's normal. They have not trained. If you look at fem fMRI images, you see on the left, long-term practitioners are dressed. Nothing happened. They are resting. When they engage in compassion, several areas of the brain activated very strongly. You take novice meditators, nothing happened and at rest, nothing happened when they try. That means, you no, know, it's part, is the result of training. So, so this shows that we can change. And even, you know, three weeks or four weeks already makes a structural change in the brain, not only functional, the brain physically changes. So that's encouraging because that means we can change as individual. And if individual change is a critical mass of individual change, then society can change. There's tipping points, there's evolution of culture that go faster than genes. You know, in the 19th century, people spoke of war as the melting pot of civilization. Of course, no one thinks that today. We change our view about relating to the environment, we become Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Right of Women, Right of Children. So our culture do change, you know, giving up tobacco and all these things. But it takes time, it takes a generation or so, but it, we can change. So we start with the individuals, then the critical mass, you know, it starts with society. You know, in the 18th century in England, 10 people said we should abolish slavery. Oh, they said, no, no way, the British Empire will collapse without slavery, it's economically not viable. Ten years later, slavery was abolished. So we, make this, we need to make this kind of strong decision today about preserving our environment that is the climate crisis, by far the one that is the most threatening in the 21st century. So we need sustainable harmony means social harmony and harmony with nature because today, by July, August, we have exhausted all the renewable resources of this earth, so we are living on Credit. The Holocene, that's the very stable period of climate we had for 10,000 years before we start messing it up. This is our Eden. We could continue for another 50,000 years if we were not disturbing so much the climate system. So we need a caring economics where there is a balance between societal index, environmental index, and economical index. And today that's not the case. The dollar is the king, so that cannot also. And also there's a good news, a social uh, psychology studied people who give. You know, it could be $20 a month or a lot of money. They studied in 30 countries and they found that people who give 
even the little or a lot, they are significantly happy, happier than others. So if money doesn't buy happiness, give it away, that's the secret. So we need local commitment. We should not feel discouraged. Oh, what can I do anything? You know, I cannot change anything, I'm just one. But we are many one, and we feel commitment and sense of global responsibility, then we can bring about change. We need to think that human beings is not the king of everything, that we are not alone. So we are trying to play our part. So since 25 years almost, we founded an organization called Karuna Sechen. Karuna means compassion, as many of you will know. Sechen, because there was already some Karuna organization. So we started to you know a few people, uh, very small, and today we are helping 400,000 people every year, mostly in India, also in Nepal, like we work in Jharkhand, Bihar, and here in, many, in several districts. And uh, Sunita Sharma, who is country director for Nepal, is here. So we work for food security. For instance, in India, we uh, spearheaded 60,000 kitchen gardens because people do monoculture, but we give them some different plants and they grow a small field and they exchange with their neighbors so they don't need to buy their vegetable for their family at the marketplace. So we did 60,000 of those gardens. We, did, we do you know, learning different skills. We have a program called Small Money, Big Change. So we plant trees and we bring it to the city in Nepal. During the 2015 earthquake, we managed to help 200,000 people in 600 villages and we built some schools. Uh, all together in the Himalayan region, we built 25 schools and, uh, and 25 dispensaries. And we had, we had a palliative care also unit. I just was in Bodh Gaya. We have a clinic that go to 600 villages. We have a mobile clinic that visit the villages. In the beginning, they didn't trust us. Now we have gained their trust, and we really have a wonderful program for health. And in Jharkhand, we built a beautiful clinic. It's a tribal area, as you probably know, the richest uh, mineral region in India, the less touristic region, so you might have something to do. But also, you know, the, it's a tribal area, so when they find uranium or copper, they move them. So very poor and very little infrastructure. Tata is doing something, so we build this clinic, and we go to hundreds of villages to bring basic uh, health care. We have a literacy program for elder women so that they can sign their name, open a bank account, so that the husband doesn't drink everything and they can send their kid to school. So they are so happy to learn how to read and write. So we also learn different techniques. We try to develop some crafts and it's so wonderful. We have also a preschool program uh, because you now the kids were put in empty places. The, the, Person who keeps them don't know what to do. They cry, they fight, parents not happy. So we do a program of learning to cooperative play in a few hundred schools. There's government school, but we improve them. And then the kids are very happy all day long, and the parents are happy, educators are happy. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. In some area of Sichuan, we intervene in the earthquake place. And we also build the earthquake resistance school at 3,700 meters. So to conclude, I'd like to quote the famous French poet Victor Hugo, nothing is more powerful than an ID, the time of which has come. And this ID is to care more for each other. And that's really the secret. You can apply that in your own life, in your work, and everything. So if you have any interest, this is our website. We have also a country director in India, and you can contact my friend Amin Gosal if you are interested to work with us, to be part of the Karuna family. And my motto is to transform ourselves to better serve others. So thank you so much for your attention. We thank Matthew Baikard for such a inspiring and wonderful uh, presentation and remarks. And thank you very much for being with us in this high conference. May I please request Mr. Cole and Mr. Sharma to felicitate and present this token of appreciation to Mr. Baikard for 
being a part of this conference and for enlightening all of us with his remarks. A big, big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, we have to take the center stage for this and take a lovely photograph to commemorate this moment as well. So, you know, my coming here was a little bit uh, improvised. You know, I'm the blah, blah monk, crazy monk. So I'm, I apologize not being able to stay longer with you, but I enjoy very much these few moments. And I hope we'll have some occasion to work together hands on. You know, we say pure heart, dirty hands. So we do something uh, actually to help society. And you are major actors for that. So thank you so much for your welcome. Thank you.